साथियों जैसा कि आपको सभी को विदित है कि ये 75 लेक्चर सीरीज हम लोग आई द्वारा भारतीय कृषि अनुसंधान परिषद द्वारा हमारा जो स्वतंत्रता का पिछहत्तरवा वर्ष पूरा होने वाला है अगले वर्ष 15 अगस्त को उसको मनाने के लिए हम लोगों ने आई ने ये पिछहत्तर लेक्चर सीरीज का एक कार्यक्रम शुरू किया है बहुत सारे और भी कार्यक्रम हैं और इन पिछहत्तर लेक्चर सीरीज में अभी तक हम लोग सोलह लेक्चर्स कर चुके हैं और बहुत ही एमिनेंट स्पीकर्स हैं हमारे जिन्होंने अभी तक लेक्चर्स दिए हैं जिनमें श्री श्री रविशंकर जी ने दिया है हमारे सारंगी साहब जो मिनिस्टर ऑफ स्टेट थे इन्होंने दिया है हमारे एक जोशी जी थे जो हैं जो एनवायरमेंट के ऊपर जिन्होंने बहुत अच्छा काम किया है पद्म भूषण भी मिला है उन्हें उनका भी लेक्चर हुआ और बहुत सारे डॉक्टर भरूचा बहुत सारे लेक्चर्स हमारे एमिनेंट पर्सन ने दिए हैं और बहुत सारे लेक्चर्स अभी होने हैं और ये हमारा एक प्लेटफॉर्म है आई सी आर सेवेंटी फाइव लेक्चर सीरीज डॉट वेब कॉन इवेंट्स डॉट कॉम जहाँ पर लोग वर्चुअली हमारे साथ जुड़ते हैं और प्रश्न भी पूछ सकते हैं लेकिन हम की पर्सन को इस जूम के तहत इस प्लेटफॉर्म पर भी जोड़ते हैं हम जो हैं तो हमारा ये कार्यक्रम चार प्लेटफॉर्म्स पर उपलब्ध है फेसबुक पर यूट्यूब पर वेबकॉन इवेंट्स पर और हमारा ये जूम पर आ, मैं आ, आज मुझे बड़ी खुशी हो रही है कि आज हमारे लिए जो एक बहुत ही एमिनेंट इकोनॉमिस्ट हैं डॉक्टर पी के जोशी साहब ही इज गोइंग टू स्पीक ऑन ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक बिल्डिंग रेजिलियंस अगेंस्ट क्लाइमेट चेंज रोल ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजीज पॉलिसीज एंड इंस्टीट्यूशन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक and uh, i don't uh, require much introduction about dr joshi but uh, i feel uh, proud in introducing him uh, for those uh, uh, who may uh, who may want to just recall their memories uh, about dr joshi dr joshi uh, superannuated as the senior advisor to the director general and director south asia international food policy research institute uh, washington prior to this he was holding the very important positions of the director icr national academy of agricultural research management nar and the director of the ncap national center for uh, of agriculture economics and policy research a key institute for all the policy related matters after his superannuation he is serving as the policy advisor to the world bank the food and agriculture organization a very uh, renowned part of this <laughs> un and the australian center for agricultural research he has extensively worked towards transforming agriculture and market integration in india and many south and southeastian southeast asian countries i keep on reading his articles uh, it's always a pleasure to read his books his articles and always to interact with him for many uh, many new ideas uh, while he is attending any meeting dr joshi has received uh, many awards to name a few uh, like uh, very prestigious dr ms randhawa memorial award of the nas uh, dr rc agrawal life achievement award of indian society of agriculture economics uh, for his outstanding contribution in social science and agriculture economics research and management the lifetime achievement award of the pantnagar alumni alma mater advancement association and the global leadership award by the indian chambers of food and agriculture he is the fellow of very prestigious nas National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, Indian Society of Agriculture Economics, Indian Society of Agriculture Engineering, and Indian Society of, of uh, Noni Research, to name a few. He has published more than ten books and very important books. They all have a global reach. Uh, all uh, the books which he has written, and several journal articles in national and international journals of the repute. Uh, Dr. Joshi was president elect of Indian Society of Agriculture Economics, conference president of Indian Society of Agriculture Marketing, conference president of Agriculture Economic Research Association of India, and the secretary general of Fourth World Congress of on Conservation of Agriculture. He is present presently the president of the Agriculture Economic Research Association and the secretary of the National Academy of Agriculture Sciences (NAS). Uh, now i will tell you the key position uh, which has been given uh, by the supreme court uh, to dr joshi uh, he was nominated as one of the four members 
uh, of a committee which was constituted by the Supreme Court of India to provide solutions on farm reforms, the most controversial topic as on date. Mm -hmm. So uh, hats off to you, uh, Dr. Joshi Zaha. He is a member of the core group uh, of Indian government's Right to Food National Human Rights Commission. And he was also a member of the Speaker's Research Initiative, a very rare chance for any researcher to go to the parliament and present uh, something before the parliamentarians. And uh, through this Speaker's Research Initiative, a committee constituted by the Honorable Speaker of the Parliament, uh, he could make that presentation and I could see the recording of that. It was uh, really uh, very informative and very, uh, I can say, a, a lifetime achievement to present yourself uh, before the parliament, parliamentarians. So thank you, Dr. Joshi Zahm. And uh, we have uh, with us uh, more than 110 participants who are connected through Zoom, but uh, through other platforms, um, I think uh, more than 1,000 persons, they are connected. And uh, this lecture, uh, which is going to talk, is his area of expertise. So I think he'll uh, present a lot of uh, analysis, a lot of uh, key points he's going to provide us about the building resilience against the climate change. And uh, Dr. Joshi Saab, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, we are really thankful to you from bottom of our heart to uh, at a very short notice uh, to accept this offer and to deliver this important lecture on a very important uh, day, on, on a very important series of lectures, which is a proud for every Indian to commemorate the 75 years of our independence. So thank you, Dr. Joshi Saab. And now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agrawal. Thank you. But I will first share to my screen. Yes, sir. One participant can share at a time. So you have to uh, un you have to give permission to me to share it my is, screen. It is, it is permitted, sir. You can share. OK. So. Arvid, it is permitted? Yeah. Is, is now, can you see? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Dr. Agrawal, a very dynamic uh, Deputy Director General Education, and my very distinguished uh, friends, uh, some of them I can see. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, series of lectures organized by Indian Council of Agriculture uh, Research uh, to commemorate uh, completion of 75 years of independence on 15th August uh, 2022. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to be part of this uh, series, which is named as Ajadi Ke Amrit Mahotsav. It's really a great honor bestowed on me by Dr. Agrawal. Dr. Agrawal, thank you so much uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, friends, you know that uh, during the last 75 years, uh, when you know Indian agriculture witnessed all-round uh, development in every sphere of agriculture, we made significant you know, uh, contribution. It was uh, so significant that it became a global success story. Uh, we were relying completely on imports of major commodities, uh, but it has completely turned around. We have surplus. We are now a country of uh, export. And on this particular, uh, you know, when I'm giving a, a talk on completion of 75 years of independence, uh, I would like to pay my homage and tribute to all those who sacrifice their life uh, for our independence. We are really grateful to all those who uh, really sacrifice everything for all of us. Uh, I, I chose this subject um, specifically on building resilience against climate change, uh, largely because you know this climate change is becoming a serious threat uh, to agriculture, livestock, and fishery sector. And I thought that let me share something, what is the role of technologies and policies and institutions in uh, building resilience. I will I have covered, uh, you know, this is broadly, I'm covering few aspects, uh, but largely I would like to give you a background. Uh, we have done a, you know, we study 
uh, with the uh, with the global program on uh, climate change agriculture and food security uh, in south asia and we have uh, undertaken several studies uh, on climate smart agriculture in south asia and last year at uh, 2020 we have our book published which is climate smart agriculture in south asia where we documented uh, all most of the studies uh, which we have covered and given there also the technologies uh, policies and institutions how these can promote climate smart agriculture so i have drawn a lot of uh, material from the from the book uh, i will be covering a brief uh, background after that i will give uh, climate change scenario and sustainable development goals how uh, climate change is being inducted in the sustainable development goals and then options to minimize impact of climate change uh, as i mentioned in my title that it is on technology policy and institution and climate uh, financing for climate action this is very important that if we have to resolve the issue of climate change financing is very very important so i will uh, just flag some of the issues on climate financing and then we will have uh, some point for uh, future on especially on what need to be done and what are the some research questions uh, which we can we can we can raise from uh, this presentation so uh, you you will all agree with me that uh, it has already been you know uh, established fact that uh, human influence on climate change is the major cause of global warming between uh, 1951 and 2010 and uh, 2019 was the second hottest year in 150 years of history just behind two, two, 2016 and we have witnessed five warmest years occurred during uh, since 2015 and 10 warmest years since uh, 2005 so the global warming we are witnessing uh, you know, up even in, in the from the beginning of this century uh, there are projections that uh, if business as usual continue uh, that then, then the global mean temperature will increase by uh, 3.7 to 4.8 degrees celsius in 2000 2000 2100 uh, in India, the global, uh, this greenhouse gas emission was uh, six, only 6.55% of the global greenhouse gas emission. Uh, you know, China, European Union and United States of America, uh, they are the top three global uh, greenhouse gas uh, emitters, uh, which constitute around 42% of the global uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, at the global level. Uh, and bottom to 100 countries you know those are the bottom they contribute only one 3.6 percent so mostly the developed world is contributing more towards uh, greenhouse gas emission as compared to developing and ultra developing countries in the greenhouse uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission in india 70 percent of the greenhouse is you know from the energy sector agriculture constitutes only 20 percent uh, in, in and agriculture has, you know, it's a one is the contributor of the uh, greenhouse gas emission, and also it absorbs it. You know, it can also absorb or mitigate greenhouse gas emission. It has both the uh, aspects on greenhouse gas. In agriculture, as a whole, livestock has 58 percent, and the uh, crop sector is contributing around uh, 42 uh, percent. Climate change impact, uh, it has been widely you know, uh, documented. Uh, I will just reflecting two, three points. One is that weakening resilience and increasing vulnerability. Uh, second is you are losing productivity, productivity loss is there and which is uh, converted into overall production. And it is also reducing livelihood opportunities of especially of the uh, poorest of the poor. Uh, with respect to crops, all the crops are being affected as a rise in temperature, milk production is being affected, fisheries production is affected, and we will have the, you know, more use of uh, water and input. Since the rise in temperature, we need more water, and the water consumption will be, uh, you know, going, uh, is increasing in agriculture sector. Uh, water is key for uh, future of uh, agriculture and as well as the non-agriculture sector. In fact, SDG six is also you know, given uh, on water, and where the they have a target number four under SDG six is the that, that is aiming for a sustainable withdrawal of water and increase use of increase water use efficiency. So 
So water is also you know being adversely affected as a result of rising temperature. Then increase in the pesticide. So as the uh, rainfall increases, temperature rises, humidity goes up, and the pests pest, uh, pest are increasing, insect and pests are increasing, and we have to go for more and more pesticide. Natural resources are being adversely affected, especially the, we are witnessing soil erosion, soil salinity, air quality, all of you are aware that it is being severely affected as a result of climate change or our own in, in, in interventions. Food insecurity and uh, poor will be much more, will be seriously affected. And we have done a very interesting study how the demand will be affected as a result of you know, increasing drought. And this we have shown that the there will be price increase uh, of rice, wheat, maize, all the commodities uh, if there is a drought, and which will adversely affect the demand for uh, different different commodities. So it is, you know, and ultimately the poorest of the poor is being affected as a result of uh, climate uh, change. Uh, several uh, forums were debating on uh, climate change since uh, the beginning of this uh, century, and several efforts uh, have been initiated at the um, regional level and as well as at the global level. Uh, and you are aware that um, uh, this, uh, the, the, all the programs are you know, directed towards uh, building resilience against uh, climate change. Among several programs, Paris Agreement was, you know, is a welcome initiative, the, which say the COP15, uh, where uh, you know, uh, this uh, COP is conference of parties. And then it started in Berlin 19. Uh, the Paris Agreement was a landmark uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in taking up the initiative on uh, climate change with uh, you know, all the parties came together and have a common agenda how to combat uh, climate change and make the, you know, it should make a very, very effective uh, for entire mankind. Uh, the goal was kept in 2015 uh, COP that by 2030, uh, countries will strive for zero carbon solution, which is representing around 70% of global emission. And it was also highlighted that they will limit global warming to well below two degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030. And by 2020, it was also uh, decided that the, uh, the countries will submit their nationally determined contributions, NDCs generally are being said, that is the strategies what they are following uh, to achieve uh, the goals which have been set under uh, COP15. Besides IPCC and you know, uh, COP15, lots of recommendations were coming. And therefore, uh, this climate change was taken as an integral part of Sustainable Development Goal in 2015. And Sustainable Development Goal 13, is characterized as the climate action because the climate change related issues are already being taken in COP15 as well as IPCC reports. So they have decided that we'll action, what kinds of actions are being taken for climate change uh, to reduce the impact of the climate change. So the actions, uh, actions were, there were, you know, few actions I have listed that the important ones under this, uh, SDG uh, 13. Uh, one is uh, they it is, it is improve resilience and adaptive capacity to climate related hazards. And number two is very important. It is integrate climate change measures into national policies, strategies, and planning. And third is improve education awareness building and of human and institutional capacity to manage uh, climate change and reduce mitigation and improve adaptation and minimize the impact of climate change. And 13.A is, is related with the funding. And they decided that they will jointly mobilize around $100 billion annually by 2020. And then promote mechanisms for raising uh, capacity for effective climate change related planning and uh, management. Now, just I will share with you that $100 billion US dollar is to be you know, collected by different, uh, all the countries. And here you know, the top five countries which committed uh, for climate change are United States of America, Japan, uh, UK, France, and Germany. These are the five top uh, contributors for uh, climate action. In US, you know, during the regime of Trump, uh, this was, they have uh, withdrawn from this agreement. 
uh, but the, the new government, uh, which again uh, decided that they will be part of the uh, Paris Agreement, and they are also contributing to uh, the to minimize the impact of your, this climate change. Uh, you know, if we have to combat or we have to, have to build resilience, uh, we have uh, a, a, a composite or a, a, a symphony of uh, four pillars. Uh, which is the technologies, policy, institutions, and infrastructure. Uh, what did this work? We developed uh, an inventory of you know various kinds of technologies in South Asia as per the different agroclimatic or agroecological zones in irrigated and rain-fed systems. We also developed an inventory of various kinds of policies and institutions which are being you know used for minimizing impact of climate change and then infrastructure. And uh, we recognize that uh, unless there is a perfect uh, symphony uh, or perfect synchronization of these four pillars, we may not achieve the desired, uh, desired uh, results. So among uh, technologies, the first uh, and which is you know, most important one, which is being promoted by uh, by CCAPS uh, or the climate change, agriculture, and food uh, security of the, you know, the global program. Uh, and also Indian Council of Agriculture Research are promoting climate uh, smart agriculture or climate resilient agriculture. ICR is mentioning climate resilient agriculture while um, CCAPS is mentioning climate smart agriculture. And it has seven uh, pillars. Uh, they, they are The seven pillars are uh, smart, the nitrogen is smart, water is smart, energy is smart, carbon is smart, weather is smart, knowledge is smart, and also the policy is smart. So these are the five, seven pillars which constitute part of the climate smart agriculture. And basically, uh, these you know components are to improve the input huge efficiencies uh, or resource huge efficiency. So that basically that and this one climate smart intervention is you know the World Bank and FAO defined in a, in, a, in, in, in a different perspective. So climate smart intervention uh, for FAO, they mentioned climate smart agriculture is number one, it in augment yield and farm income. So this is the you know, minimum condition that it must, any intervention should uh, contribute towards increase in productivity and farm income. The second is ensuring reduction in the risk, which is arising as a result of climate change. And finally, the mitigating greenhouse gas emission and carbon sequestration. So there are three conditions for a climate smart agriculture. If there any intervention which is having uh, increasing productivity and reducing risk, but not mitigating the greenhouse gas emission or not uh, no carbon sequestration, it will not be characterized as climate smart intervention. World Bank given in the term is triple wins. Triple wins means it's a win-win. Even if they are, you know if you are making investment today, and even if climate change is not occurring, uh, then we are also winning uh, in in future. So they have also similar kind of uh, components: higher productivity, uh, more carbon sequestration, and uh, greater uh, resilience to heat and uh, and 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 drought. We did some feasibility uh, studies, uh, feasibility studies in different of uh, different components of the uh, climate uh, change uh, uh, for different, uh, you know, in the uh, rain fed and irrigated environment. So we have Eastern indo gangetic Plain, Western indo gangetic Plain. These are the two uh, typical, uh, you know, uh, agro eco zones which, having, which are having a different kind of uh, situation, one has scale, scanty of water, another has surplus water, one has its limited labor, other region has surplus labor. So they are completely contrast of each other. So we purposefully selected this, uh, and here I'm presenting only these two, what we have done in, in, in Nepal and, and uh, Bangladesh, as well as in Southern part, Southern India, especially Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Maharashtra. Uh, what we did, we used you know, uh, five indicators to assess the feasibility. We used uh, one efficiency indicator that is you know, increasing the, uh, the, the profit or improving the resource use efficiency. Second indicator is uh, on equity, how these particular technological intervention is, you know, uh, is minimizing the, uh, the inequality 
among the farming community in a particular region then gender how important uh, this particular technology is giving to uh, gender and how it is you know using resources more sustainability and environment it is basically uh, carbon sequestration or greenhouse gas emission so these five indicators we have uh, used and and you know that there is a trade off if a technology or any intervention is giving you higher profit but it may also contribute more of uh, of greenhouse gas emission or it may also use over exploitation of uh, ground water or other resources so there are trade offs uh, between these uh, these components so we need to minimize the trade offs but what we did we just uh, initial stage when we were prioritizing these uh, indicator these technology uh, we thought that uh, let us have uh, you know uh, for these five indicators let us develop an index and compare it the existing farmer practices and there are a comparison has been shown in this uh, in this uh, graph uh, and if you see that in both these situation uh, the interventions are completely different for if, if in, in in eastern india it is that times uh, the systems of rice intensification were very popular and government was giving lot of emphasis on systems of rice intensification though we do not hear about systems of rice intensification now uh, then the, the direct seeded rice and varieties were also important in the eastern igp and western one punjab haryana side the leisure land leveling was very important and water management you know see this and this uh, nutrient management we are very uh, top 3 uh no in terms of the feasibility analysis we have observed then uh, we compare we try to see that uh, that was our analysis uh, and then we try to see what are the preference of the farmers how farmers are preferring these climate smart technologies and what uh, they would like to pay for these technologies or not and for each indicator uh, we have tried to uh, see that how it is uh, being preferred by uh by the by the farmers so just see again comparison when we went to the farmer interacted with the farmer uh did lots of interactions and then you can see that you know eastern igp as well as western igp they have given highest preference for leisure leisure land leveling so they recognize the importance of leisure land leveling uh, it, it it you know it um, it uh, reduces uh, losses it improves the water use efficiency so all operations are being are getting better off but when you say go to the second one eastern india is the rain water management so you have excess water rain water so they are preferring any intervention which can manage uh, rain while in western region it is the direct seeded rice uh, because of the labor scarcity also the water so the direct seeded rice is, is getting uh, important and then uh, in in the western region it is nutrition is also important leaf color chart and in integrated nutrient management are are important this we have tried to you know develop a trajectory of uh, this um, uh, in fact the conservation agriculture activities were linked with the climate smart agriculture uh, because those interventions were uh, there so this the issue the these were being introduced since the beginning of the century so uh, we try to develop a, the trajectory on adoption of a uh, various climate smart agriculture technology and compared with the combined harvester which is you now uh, being traditionally being used and that was a at higher level of our um, you know in the, in the frontier and we can see that the uh, the um, this leisure land leveling uh, this is the leisure land leveling the area under a leisure land leveling in haryana is uh, is increasing but now it, uh, over the years it has you no know, it, it's, it's increasing with uh, uh, decreasing rate while in punjab it is uh, growing at a very fast rate now uh, but uh, one important thing that uh, zero tillage zero tillage is also is better much better in haryana as compared to uh, as compared to the punjab because punjab farmer are also going for mostly you know in that belt uh, is uh, is a, a belt of uh, uh, basmati rice so this this uh, this is not getting very zero tillage is not getting prominence uh, we have also tried to see that how one technology is interacting with another technology and uh, observe that there is a strong correlation between technology adoption if uh, someone is going for leisure land leveling he will also go to zero tillage 
and if someone is going for zero uh, rotavator he is not going to go for the zero today so very strong correlation is uh, is there in adoption of uh, these kinds of uh, uh, technologies benefits uh, we have tried to document the benefits some studies were already done uh, by cimet and we have also taken up some studies so we have observed that there was a yield advantage a cost reduction was there water use was saved a huge quantity of water was saved 20 to 35% water was saved energy is being saved you know these are the two important component which contribute to the greenhouse gases or if you manage these properly you can reduce the greenhouse gases so energy saving is there tractor time is being saved and there were projections that uh, 1 million barrel oil will be saved if uh, 3.5 million hectare area is covered in punjab and haryana uh, internal rate of return was very high you know 57% assuming that a 33% adoption is there so it's a very very good uh, internal rate of return uh the carbon sequestration was more than 1 ton per hectare uh, and reducing greenhouse gas emission so here you can see that you know in this uh, graph uh, uh, the uh, net benefit is coming uh, from you know two one is the uh, yield increase and cost saving so yield increase was not that uh, high as you know, cost saving so this is uh, in in haryana it is you know 65% uh, 40 coming from uh 40 coming from uh, cost saving and 25 coming from uh, yield while in 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 in, in uh, punjab the yields were not increasing uh, as a result of these uh, interventions now coming to the policies uh, that was a part of on technologies uh, they were playing important role in all you know improving resource use efficiencies as well as uh, uh, minimizing greenhouse uh, gas emission and increasing productivity Uh, of uh, our uh, uh, different commodities uh, <clears throat> now coming to public policies and institutions uh, public policies play very very important role so public policies uh, trigger you know or attract private sector and public investment also you know in the attract the or trigger a private investment and they are contributing in uh, in 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 Uh, building our agriculture development process much faster so public policy you know they play important role uh, in ma managing or reducing uh, resilience uh, against climate change so uh, we have listed i have listed few of the public policies like uh, agriculture reform especially pricing and marketing and trade related issues investment and subsidy policies you know like uh, investment in, in, in irrigation subsidies on water electricity all these things land irrigation and watershed development uh, risk mitigation mitigating policies and programs like risk mitigation government of india started insurance for example so those kinds of public policies uh, are important for uh, reducing the impact of climate change private investment is for service providers particularly machines and micro irrigation like drip sprinkler irrigation financing for inputs machines value chain development uh, market development insurance uh, by the private sector value added information by the private sector about uh, the weather and other uh, factors uh, farmers investment is uh, changing input usage uh, commercialization of uh, and modernization diversification of production portfolio they are you now affecting uh, resource use and uh, they also affect the uh, land use patterns and finally uh, contribute in our uh, profitability of different commodities uh, we have tr also try to have this you know impact of uh, micro irrigation how it will uh, it will contribute in building resilience <coughs> and also uh, improving uh, like uh, in productivity profitability and uh, uh, this risk uh, mitigation strategy uh, this is uh, uh, a classical example and it is being lot of studies are there on this uh, we have tried to see under two scenario under existing area under micro irrigation uh, how it is going to will and then potential area if we can achieve uh, 42 million hectares the potential area uh, for uh, micro irrigation systems if we can achieve that then how it will have an impact so we can you can see from there that there is a considerable amount of water is being saved 
food production is expected to increase uh, food availability per capita is going to improve and the most important one is reduction in the greenhouse gas emission so is a huge amount of greenhouse gas emission is being uh, is, is being is is, is uh, uh, reduced we have also uh, tried to see that the impact of overall you know, the policies of different uh, uh, sectors. I'll just share with you that we realized that in the past, past policies were also uh, you know, combating climate change. They were also climate resilient, but it was not being addressed from the point of view of the climate change. That time the policies, institutions, programs were initiated to increase productivity, but we never look these policies, these programs from the perspective of resilience and mitigation. So we thought that let us try how these uh, past policies impacted, uh, you know, on uh, uh, this impacted uh, on mitigation, adaptation, and resilience as well as sustainability in agriculture. And it's a very interesting analysis. And we have, you can see that you know we have used. Uh, uh, four broad uh, sectors. One is the irrigation sector, that is uh, largely the uh, surface irrigation. And we have uh, uh, micro irrigation, uh, that is largely the tube well or the drip irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, uh, groundwater energy, sorry, groundwater energy, the, uh, this um, uh, tube wells, the micro irrigation is drip and sprinkler, and fertilizer policy. So these policies how they are affecting mitigation, adaptation, resilience, and sustainability. And you can see, I have just categorized, uh, we have numbers also, but I have categorized as you know, low, fair, high, and excellent. And you can see that in mitigation, irrigation has, you know, it, uh, it contributed in mitigating uh, the greenhouse gas emission. Micro irrigation, uh, the, at the current level, it was fair, but uh, it has potential to excellent. Groundwater energy is fair. And fertilizer in mitigation is a very poor, it's a positive response. You know, it is contributing to the greenhouse gas emission. Adaptation, uh, all the policies were no large, all the policies except the micro irrigation, if it is being covered in a potential area, is excellent, otherwise, it is fair. Uh, resilience, you know, all the components are building resilience. And that's why we say now that the Indian agriculture has become resilient against climate change. So, because all the you know, uh, if you if you recall any drought or any flood earlier, we used to have lots of you know the immediately there will be shortage of food production. Uh, but during last 20-25 uh, years, you will realize that uh, these droughts or hailstorms they are not impacting much on the Indian food uh, food system. And resilience is in all these sectors, the policies of the past were build the resilience. And sustainability, uh, the irrigation, surface irrigation, it's a low. I said naturally, it's a lot of used leakages are there. So it's a, it's a low. Uh, micronutrient, existing one, it is fair, but if you have the potential one, it will be good. Energy is a very, very, very low. And the fertilizer is again a low uh, with respect to the sustainability. Solar is the is a potential climate uh, you know, smart technology or uh, the, the climate uh, um, smart uh, policy, and this is this has this this has all the three components: the adaptation, uh, risk mitigation, and the uh, uh, greenhouse gas or more carbon sequestration is here in the solar solar one. It's a perfect uh, a perfect blending. Uh, you know that India is leading international solar alliance. Uh, we our honorable prime minister called the meetings of several countries who are uh, who have more solar power so we are leading in this one and the pm kusum was also introduced it adds solar and other renewable capacity of 25750 megawatt by 2020 with the financial support of 34422 crores so this program is basically to you know, increase our uh, this the a solar power uh, for for agriculture as, as a non-agriculture sector. We did uh, some uh, studies uh, on solar power, uh, where in, this is from Bihar study, where uh, the, the 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 some of the pumps, tube wells were transformed to solar pumps. Uh, earlier they were uh, they were um, petrol, or then uh, diesel came, 
uh, these and then this um, um, battery operated ones were also started but some places these were replaced by the solar so what we observed that uh, there was a 100% uh, transplanting by 31st august where there was solar as compared to only 27% in the non solar areas and the irrigation cost of nursery raising was also reduced in solar areas uh, most important was that you know we all the time talk of the rice, the rice fellow system but we observed that 57% solar farmers took some crop you know three crops uh, they are taking uh, these farm 57% as compared to non solar only 28% so we have also revived several articles uh, important one here is that india is now becoming a leader mega leader in in, in solar uh, renewable energy so our prime minister has mentioned that 175 gigawatt renewable energy uh, will be there including 100 gigawatt uh, of solar energy by 2030 and this will require around 100 billion us dollar uh, so this is a huge amount but they are, they, all the organizations public sector private sector they are coming up uh, in achieving this goal uh, for example tata's adani's reliance they are investing uh, for for green energy they are coming up uh, with their own own programs the other day reliance announced that uh, 20 5% of this uh, this uh, target uh, they will alone meet uh, in in india so solar is also giving you higher higher productivity reduce the cost in some places this solar is uh, not as a as an instrument of you know uh, energy but it is considered as a solar crop uh, with the farmers i visited uh, gujarat where they can sell the electricity to the government also in the agriculture sector so when they need uh, they are using solar for irrigation uh, for themselves or for neighboring farmers if they don't they can sell energy or power to the government and get a profit from there as well so it's being treated as a as a solar solar crop rather than a, for only for for farmers benefit this is for uh, our uh, residue burning uh, i have just showed the conceptual framework uh, residue burning why farmers are uh, burning residue despite you know uh, huge uh, pollution uh, uh, greenhouse gases pollution and adverse effect on human and animal health despite of that the farmers are you know burning uh, their the residue uh, you can see that you know this uh, ph here is the is uh, is the uh, this side is the private cost here the social cost so the farmers uh, cost is affecting the society uh, ph is the uh, farmers uh, cost uh, uh, sorry uh, residue burning pl is the residue burning as a pl is the residue burning here he is burning all his crop residue and uh, here is the social cost this uh, cost farmer is having this cost uh, the society uh, health and other aspects of the, of the pollution uh, this is the social cost but when we ask them to go for zero tillage and other uh, means that this is the cost of the farmer this is the private cost when the private cost is so high the social cost is very very low so farmer is having very high uh, cost so we have to we need to see that how we can bridge this we bring down this cost I, uh, one is the technology second is that we need to give incentive to farmers subsidies to the farmers or we make regulations and legal acts so that we bridge this uh, gap and reduce the cost uh, the private cost and the social cost so this is very important and this is an area for future uh, research of my colleagues now uh, uh, coming to the uh, key issues uh, you know in upscaling uh, climate smart agriculture uh, one is that we have limited resources but uh, multiple opportunities a government of, of for example government of india or any state government they have limited resources to allocate to uh, multiple areas so uh, this this particular component getting uh, least preference often uh, so we need to see that how we can you know um, bring other sec uh, components together and make it more attractive the second one is this climate smart agriculture Uh, is a new concept and we have less expertise in this area 
uh, both in research as well as in extension, as well as in project formulation and implementation. When we were undertaking these uh, studies, we uh, were interacting with the different state governments uh, in all three countries. We also realized that the project project formulation and implementation was also a problem among uh, the government departments. So this lack of capacity is there, and this is a this is a package of intervention. This is not like seed. Uh, seed is very you know once we have a good seed which is uh, um, tolerating uh, the drought or flood or resistance to various uh, uh, diseases or insects. Uh, this is a package, and package is and also it's a it's a uh, location specific uh, packages are there. So success at one place uh, did not give us a guarantee that it will be successful in other location also. We have seen that Eastern Indo-Gantic Plain and Western Gantic Plain, the same recommendation cannot be made. So location specificity is, is the important one. Secondly, when farmers are adopting that, they are not adopting as a full package, they are adopting in sequence. It's, there is a stepwise adoption of uh, various, various components. And they also modify the, 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 the intervention as per their own resource endowment, also as per their convenience. And then upscaling process and mechanisms are yet to be evolved. So I met, you know, secretary of the uh, interstate uh, uh, coordination uh, secretary, and he was mentioning that we do not have any governance mechanism on the climate change. So the upscaling processes and mechanisms are yet to be uh, evolved. And there are always, you know, short-term uh, revenues or profit versus long-term uh, investment are al always there. You just imagine of the watershed program. Uh, watershed, in fact, is a climate smart um, uh, program, and which we never uh, recognize that this is, this can be a water a climate smart intervention. If you invest today, you, you are not getting returns immediately. They are the long-term returns uh, today's investment is giving you returns after uh, three four four years and then it is uh, become sustainable uh, for long term climate fund is important financing as i was mentioning is very very important for climate actions which sdgs have uh, promulgated so they have developed a green uh, climate fund at the global level green climate fund and all countries are you know, trying to get funds from this uh, uh, this one, and they have divided this into uh, two categories. One is a special climate fund, and second is particularly for least developed countries fund. So many least developed countries fund uh, were submitting. We helped the government of Nepal uh, for submitting a proposal under uh, this uh, green climate uh, fund. And the, as I was mentioning in the beginning, that uh, hundred billion dollar was uh, was was targeted for. 2020, we do not have the now how much they have already uh, mobilized, but by 2018, they have mobilized around uh, 79 or 80 billion dollars were being uh, realized. Maybe I think they will meet the uh, meet the target because the US government has now uh, already committed, again committed for, uh, for participation in the uh, COP. Uh, Asia is getting, you know, benefited largest share, which is getting around 43% is getting from Green Climate Fund, uh, followed by Africa and the most of the Latin American countries, 70, 71, 17%. And 70% of the climate fund is going to mitigate uh, or the reducing the, um, the greenhouse gas emission or uh, contributing towards the, uh, the uh, global warming. And 21% is for adoption of the, for adapting climate change. And 9% is for cross-cutting activities. And 70% is going to middle-income countries. And 20% is going to a regional, uh, regional, you know, they will like entire South Asia, Southeast Asia, or SARC, or ASEAN, like that. The carbon credit is uh, another, uh, is a important source uh, for, to attract the, uh, the, the you know, people, the, the stakeholders to, to trade for carbon. And carbon trading is a, is a direct, is a private benefit. Uh, a public sector can also take advantage of uh, the carbon trading. And carbon credit is a, is, a, is a tradable certificate for right to emit carbon. If I have the right to emit carbon, I can take the uh, tradable certificate. And global carbon market is growing at a very fast rate. In 2020, 
uh, its its market was around 273 billion US dollar. It's increasing at the rate of 20 percent per year. So huge market is there. So it's a, we can become a very important source of earnings for even for the farming community. India, the very conservative estimates uh, show that India may uh, gain around 10 billion US dollars. Very conservative estimate, but India has more potential uh, for uh, for carbon trading. I have listed few cases where carbon trading have already started. Uh, one is the private sector, which uh, Jindal uh, Group, uh, Steel Group, uh, which is now for by next 10 years. Uh, they are you not. Know, they will trade 225 million US dollar by saving uh, carbon. In Andhra Pradesh, a few in some villages, uh, they are selling uh, carbon dioxide credit uh, in 147 by growing uh, pongam, pongomia trees in their own villages. So that's a trading they have already done. Uh, Handia Forest, Madhya Pradesh, uh, you know, the poor villagers they have also started, and they are earning 300 million. 300,000 uh, annually uh, by restoring 10,000 hectare degraded country land. And one important thing is that carbon is now considered as a commodity. And it is being also traded in multi-commodity exchange. They have got the permission. And since 2008, uh, the multi-commodity exchange have started the carbon trading as characterized as the uh, carbon uh, Indian government recently submitted its uh, report of different uh, uh, different uh, uh, SDG achievements, and they have uh, done a very good analysis on performance of different uh, SDGs. You can go through to this one. It's a very good uh, document which has been uh, developed by Niti Aayog, uh, covering all the SDGs. What is the performance of different states uh, in different SDGs? So they have characterized or uh, divided the performance into four broad areas. One, they said uh, the achievers. The second is the front runners. Uh, third is the performance aspirants. Uh, last is the aspirant. They are not saying the backward, but the, uh, they have correct used this aspirant, but they are laggard in achieving or having better performance. So if you uh, look to this uh, graph, you know, the, this is the, I have not listed here any uh, union territories, except I have used intensely the Luxadeep. Luxadeep is the achiever, 100%, uh, no, they have uh, taken all the actions which have been initiated. So 100% achiever, uh, but other states, you know, they are uh, the, uh, if you look to this area, uh, these are the mostly in this red one, aspirant or the backward one, uh, they are from the eastern and northeast region, except uh, you know, a few like uh, Haryana, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, otherwise, they are largely from eastern India and northeast uh, India, where uh, we have uh, huge potential for increasing agriculture production. So this belt is having one a potential for increased productivity, and second is you know adapting to climate change as well, minimizing the climate uh, uh, risk and can go for uh, carbon trading. Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Telangana, these are, you know, they are the front runner. They have, you know, uh, may achieve 100% in uh, two, three, two, three years. So this gives us a clear picture that how different states are performing with respect to uh, climate change, uh, climate uh, action point of view. Now, important thing uh, when we are, you know, we have we are uh, promoting uh, climate uh, smart agriculture or reducing risk of climate change. Uh, the, we have lots of programs. Uh, one, uh, they have not intended to minimize the, um, the greenhouse gas emission or adapting to climate change, but they have different intents. But they are climate smart as well. Uh, what we propose that we need to converge these programs and policies at one go, and then these programs, you know, they are, right now they are they are in different silos. They are independently uh, taken up. So if we integrate these programs, converge these programs, uh, then we can increase incomes and minimize risk and reduce greenhouse gas emission, and also finally minimize the risk. Uh, these programs, uh, India has already um, allocated around 4 billion US dollar, which is 15% of the agriculture expenditure. So these programs, you know, they are few, uh, but uh, the huge amount has been allocated to these programs. And we can take advantage of these programs with respect to achieving our 
sustainable development goal 13 and they are also contributing to other sustainable development goal like one uh, two uh, 13 uh, uh, 14 and other uh, goals uh, we, we government has also committed that by uh, next five years 13 billion us dollar will be allocated to these uh, kinds of programs so what are other investment opportunities uh, for, for, uh, for for these programs uh, one is that in 2015, the government of India uh, created a fund. Uh, this is National Adaptation Fund, which has been for climate change, which has been, NABARD has been given responsibility to use this one. And they have various kinds of programs that are uh, giving capacity building, climate smart villages or climate resilient villages. They are undertaking several kinds of programs and also supporting various kinds of activities to the state governments and other uh, those who are requesting for funding from uh, this source. The second one, uh, we need to think that how we can develop large scale grant proposals, uh, state level as well as country level and submit to ADB or IFAD or World Bank. So grant uh, proposals will also help us to supplement or complement our ongoing efforts in taking action against climate change. Then we develop uh, processes for outscaling climate action plans. So we need to as I was mentioning that we do not have any governance structure. Uh, the, the programs are independent in isolation. So we need to develop a process that how the in convergence, these programs can be upscaled. And we need to also see that how we can tap corporate social responsibility fund and then uh, converge existing climate change programs and policies that already I have uh, mentioned. Then integrate climate action activities uh, with an income augmentation, poverty alleviation program. For example, uh, Manrega. Manrega has already been integrated with the uh, climate action. So many places, uh, the Manrega is being used uh, for climate action. And 13.1 uh, um, SDG action is to uh, integrate government programs with the uh, climate uh, risk management. And then enable policy, policy makers and policy advisors. So we need to engage them. We have to develop the capacity is to be improved of the policy makers as well as policy advisors, uh, both in developing the proposals. Uh, we develop for Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, for some of the states, we help them to develop proposals for uh, one for the NABAR and second for the, uh, the Green Fund. So finally, friends, uh, I will just summarize what I mentioned. Uh, we need to explore uh, promising uh, climate smart uh, technologies, uh, what are for agro eco region wise, uh, which can improve efficiency, uh, sustainability, resilience, and uh, environment. And we need to support uh, policies which are pro poor and integrate with the climate smart policies and climate smart institutions. And we also see that how we can promote private sector for developing inclusive, sustainable, and climate smart value chains. The role of value chains, uh, food system is very important in you know, managing climate change. And this uh, value chain development may be at the national level, regional level, as well as uh, global level. And mainstream uh, disruptive technology. This is very important that we, how can we mainstream disruptive technologies uh, like agri -tech technology, agri advisory services, financial inclusion, marketing uh, to offset the problem of uh, uh, risk arising as a result of climate change. Then capacity development must receive highest priority uh, for all these stakeholders. So this is the minimum, this is the necessary uh, conditions for managing climate change. Uh, some research questions I have uh, put if someone who is interested to take up future research. Number one, how climate change can be mainstreamed in agriculture investment. This is one. Second, uh, what is the science and technology policy towards climate change? Uh, should climate change be an independent program or should it should be an integral or mainstream in agriculture system? It should have a component in each program. So we have the options and once and can, someone can evaluate that which will be more effective, more efficient, uh, more rewarding. Uh, what is the technology delivery policy to manage climate risk? India, a lot of you know, work has been done under KVK's climate. Krishi uh, Vigyan Kendra, they have climate resilient villages. So what lessons we are learning from these villages, climate uh, resilient villages, which uh, KVK have already done. So what lessons we can take up for further delivery of uh, technologies and other components uh, among the farming community. 
uh, how smart is energy policy right now uh, that is driving uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation especially uh, electricity pricing which is giving for groundwater exploitation uh, water pricing largely for surface irrigation solar power farm mechanization subsidy in that one use of uh, friendly how we can have user friendly carbon credit mechanisms a lot of research should be taken up that how we can use the carbon credit mechanisms uh, for the benefit of you know those who are who can trade carbon uh, for their own uh, benefits how are risk mitigation policies uh, are performing for example the agriculture insurance how it is performing and there are not very you know very satisfactory reports on climate agriculture insurance so that day i was referring that can we have a universal agriculture insurance rather than you know different different farmers are taking insurance how i not to have a a group insurance like we do in our in our um, our the government policy we have uh, when i was a staff with icr so there was a group insurance so why not to have a group insurance of the entire uh, farmers of the entire state and one nation one insurance kind of policy can be uh, designed and uh, the triggers can be identified for uh, giving compensation to the farming community so friends these are the some of the points i would like to uh, share with you and i would like to uh, thanks uh, dr agrawal for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity and uh, even given me honor to be a part of this important initiative thank you so much thank you sir thank you very much sir for this elaborative talk and uh, very useful information and a topic which is of utmost importance in today's time for the agriculture because we all are seeing even the common man has started seeing the impact of the uh, climate now uh, the frequent uh, uh, hot days the frequent uh, warm days as you see the untimely rains many many things so it is really a concern of uh, common man now uh, and everybody has started seeing that yes we have to address this problem uh, earlier people thought of it's only of a, uh, this subject is only of the intellectuals but now because we all are facing the problem so i, I think the the points which we have raised uh, which we have suggested which we have uh, uh, indicated they are all uh, very relevant uh, very uh, rightly you have said uh, uh, about different options what can be the climate uh, uh, smart we thought uh, only one or two points but you just told they can be nitrogen smart they can be policy smart knowledge smart energy is smart carbon is smart water is smart so there are so many ways we can show our smartness and we have to really have these four pillars for this climate actions technologies policies institutions and five sector so i think you have touched all the aspects and if i see the the comments box they are just complimenting you i just read from dr randeep singh he says that excellent presentation sir farmers in the south east here rely on uh, dairy farming and reducing emissions is a critical issue similarly fish farming also adds to gas emission and challenges are same how to address is an issue so he just uh, making uh, a comment only and there is a uh, very important uh, intervention from uh, dr ashok uh, kr the director of cards Uh, he says that uh, as you rightly said emissions are very high due to few developed countries and the trade offs but impacts are global public bets affecting vulnerable uh, low income countries while mitigation efforts are to be global to be effective adaptation becomes the necessity of individual countries obviously the developed countries has to bear the cost of mitigation and investment in r and d in green technologies the global policies institutions and multilateral negotiations need to address these issues so very uh, important intervention uh, we thank you uh, very much uh, dr ashok uh, for this important uh, point uh, dr bansal also is just uh, complimenting you dr malvika dadlani uh, is also complimenting you Uh, and she says the very stimulating talk on new technology including gm must also be assessed on the scale of csa climate smart agriculture uh, we have uh, the comments from dr jha 
who is our edg uh, it is an excellent presentation climate change need policy intervention in past harvest how agriculture is left honorable sir can something be think of in this direction so any uh, comment uh, dr joshi sir you want to make yeah okay good thank you thank you so much for giving uh, lots of uh, good comments so thanks a lot um, i hope i have not taken lot of time dr agrawal yeah. uh, so uh, i will start with dr jha last question post harvest uh, yes uh, they you know the emissions are very high at the post harvest and that in fact is going to the uh, uh, that side uh, energy this is being covered on the energy not coming in agriculture sector so the value chains uh, we have to see that uh, how we can improve the value chain our transport system uh, we have very low fuel efficient uh, transport roads now getting better but not that so the value chain uh, after harvesting when it is going to ultimately to the consumer uh, is not very efficient so you are very right that post harvest is being taken into consideration but it is going to energy sector uh, the second uh, dr malvika has mentioned about the all new technologies including gm and dr bansal has mentioned about the varieties so the you know when i am saying the climate is smart agriculture it, it should have three components one is the uh, increasing productivity variety gm everyone is increasing your productivity second is adapting to the climate which you no know, you can have varieties which are resistant to diseases droughts insect uh, but when coming to the third component the greenhouse gas emission so the varieties you uh, know will i don't know whether in the long run physiologists can, can help in to the breeders that how they can you know absorb more and more carbon uh, they were doing some research they are plant type they were changing rice to g c4 quite kind of plant they were developing so therefore i have not included intensely the variety because this component is is missing in 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 that uh, aspect and the uh, the developed world is contributing more uh, the us you know is is contributing 17% of greenhouse gas emission which is highest among all the countries uh, therefore these developed countries are contributing uh, resources funding they are giving that's why the green fund is being controlled uh, is being they are giving fund to the developed developing countries and lot of money has come to uh, south asian country and african countries uh, of the the problem which they have they have uh, they have created livestock is yes very perfectly uh, we have large number of uh, animals uh, their productivity is very low in all the south asian countries uh, but there are you know technologies have already been developed like feeding different methods of feeding are there shelters uh, is, you know you have to have a different kind of shelter grazing all those issues they have already been developed so we need to see how we can manage our uh, livestock sector so these are the few points i think i have covered all these thank you points. thank you uh, dr joshi sir uh, dr neeja prabhakar our vice chancellor from uh, uh, telangana she says that uh, the power guda is from telangana state sir please note it yeah sorry i will change it i will change it sorry sorry yeah <laughs> So, uh, so yes. Dr. Joshi, thank you, thank you, sir, very much. And you can see uh, the participants. We have Dr. Gautam with us. We had Dr. Dr. Bansal. We have uh, Dr. Pramod Agrawal, uh, and many uh, key persons uh, are present uh, today in this lecture. Uh, many of our directors, ADGs, they are present in this lecture. Uh, in ex Uh, in uh, addition to the vice chancellors uh, i see dr rp singh vice chancellor dr nirja prabhakar and many others i are difficult to name all of them so it was a very elaborate talk and uh, very useful uh, information uh, dr joshi sir as usual you have given and i am sure that all our audience would have greatly benefited with this and they can uh, further interact with you uh, through the personal chat or through the personal uh, mails so thank you very much uh, for this uh, important lecture and i request all the audience to please stay connected uh, every week we have this lecture uh, by eminent persons next week we are going to have a lecture of uh, dr umesh reddy uh, from uh, united states so he is a very uh, very excellent uh, researcher so i'll give you the information uh, about that lecture so thank you joshi sir namaskar Thank you thank you so much for giving this platform thank, thank you, you.